And now, broadcasting on Star Worldwide Networks, it's time for the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show with Snowden Bishop. Listen in as Snowden interviews cannabis industry pioneers, marijuana experts, policymakers, medical practitioners, patients, and other amazing individuals with compelling stories to share. It all happens right now. Here's the Cannabis Reporter, Snowden Bishop. Hi, and welcome back to the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. I'm your host, Snowden Bishop, and very happy to be here today. We've spent a lot of time on this show praising the many virtues of cannabis as a safer alternative to some of the world's most dangerous drugs. We have, at times, spared no words in disdain for the powerful pharmaceutical industry as a whole. Granted, it has set itself up for some harsh criticism. Pharmaceutical companies have been protected to the point that they are seldom held accountable when their drugs are found to cause irreversible complications like kidney failure or even death, as long as they disclose the long list of side effects in consumer marketing. They're also notorious for naming their own prices, inadvertently gouging insurance companies and patients with markups that would never fly in other countries. Why do they do it? Because they can. But why does our government let them get away with it? Well, that's a bit more complicated. As one of the most powerful forces in Washington, Big Pharma spends millions of dollars financing election campaigns and lobbies against regulation, health care reform, and basically anything else that would compete with their bottom line. Cannabis seems to be the pharmaceutical industry's Achilles heel. And, well, for good reason. Cannabis is a perceived threat with potential to replace some of the most commonly prescribed drugs that make pharmaceutical companies among the most profitable in the world. Those perceived losses explain why pharma companies spend millions of dollars fighting state legalization measures as well. It also explains why pharmaceutical lobbyists are at the ready with dangling carrots whenever anti-prohibition measures are introduced in Congress. Campaign contributions provide compelling incentives. A vote in the wrong direction could potentially amount to political suicide. The irony is that potential loss of profit pharmaceutical companies could suffer if cannabis were allowed to compete would likely be a wash compared to the millions of dollars spent lobbying against it each year. Also, the perceived threat of cannabis regulation is slightly overblown. The truth is that legalizing cannabis won't eliminate the need for pharmaceuticals. Think about it. Before synthetic drugs were invented, opium, coca, and cannabis plants were commonly used for anesthesia and pain. Honey, cayenne pepper, and other plant-based remedies were commonly used to ward off influenza and the common cold. But millions of lives were lost to preventable and curable illnesses like infections, which now can be treated with pharmaceutical drugs. And despite the dangers of opiates, they are necessary for extreme pain or serious injury cancer, or other debilitating conditions. Pharmaceutical companies would be well served to embrace cannabis for its potential to solve some of the most consequential problems facing the pharmaceutical industry today. That is something that our guest is more than qualified to discuss with us today. So let's get started. I am really happy to introduce Dr. Bobby Day. He's a pain management expert and co-founder of what is now known as the National Spine and Pain Center. As the largest pain management practice in the nation, it's also one of the leading prescribers of opiates. Having spent more than 15 years working with patients who require opiate therapy, Dr. Day witnessed a notable decrease in opiate abuse among his patients who also happened to use medical cannabis. He eventually retired from his practice to pursue his interest in cannabis as an alternative therapy, and he's now the chief medical officer of CLIMB Holdings, and there's an acronym for that, which I'll let him explain, but there he guides medical best practices along with a team of venture capital, investment banking, and marketing experts who envision bringing medical benefits of cannabis to patients across the country. So Dr. Day, thank you so much for joining me today. Great. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted that you're here. And I really wanted to talk to you about your experiences with seeing patients who happen to be using cannabis, whether legal medical use or recreationally or however they did it. What was the big tell? Sure. So let me explain by saying that our uh, practice, which provided opiates for patients uh, that had medical indications to take it, 
uh, had a strict policy against uh, Schedule One illicit substances, uh, which included heroin, cocaine, uh, and unfortunately marijuana as well. And and uh, marijuana was kind of swept into cannabis was swept into that group of drugs. Um, Schedule One basically means that the medication the the drug uh, doesn't have any benefits and it can be addictive. And cannabis was classified back in the 70s as a Schedule One drug, not because there was any evidence for this, but really because they hadn't done enough studies. And, and the idea was to come back and do enough research and then classify it properly, but that never happened. So from the 70s until today, the research that was promised or, or, or thought to have been done was never done. Now, when we were seeing patients who were on opiates and, and having classified cannabis according to government standards and, and really DEA standards, we had to let patients know that if they were taking an illicit substance, that they would be discharged from the practice um, and, and sent to rehab, uh, drug rehab centers and so on. And, and what I noticed was that when I was giving my patients opiates, that um, the ones that were taking cannabis did not require an escalation of the opiate. Now, typically when you're giving somebody opiates, uh, within about three months or so, uh, there is a... Um, phenomenon that happens where these receptors in our spine get filled with the drug and you need more drug in order to have the same benefit. And therefore, patients taking opiates require an escalation over time. And I, I noticed that in the pa patients taking cannabis, who I chose because it was my choice to make with the patient not to discharge from the practice, that they were taking it safely. And we had an understanding and I documented in every note that they were taking cannabis and I uh, advised them that taking cannabis with opiates can have potential consequences that we're not aware of. And so having this understanding between a patient and doctor, we continued forward uh, with a situation where they were taking cannabis, they were taking opiates, and these patients five years out were taking the same dosage of opiates that they started taking when they initially entered my practice. So anecdotally, that, that was opening moment to say, wow, that this is synergistic and not uh, something that's antagonistic. Yeah, I find that really interesting because obviously when you build up a tolerance to anything, I mean, even even antibiotics over time, people build a tolerance to and, and need more and more of the same drug to get the same effect. So when the patients would disclose that they were using cannabis and you documented it in their file, was this a, a rule that came down from the DEA or was this a rule that was basically set by the clinic? This is a rule that really is a standard in medicine, mm -hmm. that if somebody is taking a Schedule 1, uh, let's give uh, as an example cocaine. If you're taking cocaine and you're taking opiates, it's very, very harmful because the two together can cause a lot of significant harmful effects. And, and so it was considered an illicit substance. Patients who are taking illicit substances had the potential, high potential of addiction, and therefore they shouldn't receive opiates. So that was a medical standard that's well-known in all top-rated institutions, and, and so we also practiced it in that sense. But uh, m myself and another doctor in the group chose not to do that with cannabis patients because we said that cannabis is not addictive. It's not the same drug as a cocaine or a heroin, and that, um, that these patients taking it with physician guidance and understanding can, can definitely take it if, if we so chose uh, to allow them to and, and still provide them with opiate prescriptions. Yeah, and are you still working with patients now at all, or are you mainly just focused on CLIME no. buildings? I, uh, yeah, I really have retired as of 2011 from seeing patients, and then from 2012 going to a regular job in general. Um, I started CLIME uh, in June of this year with private equity, an operator already in the cannabis space, with the idea uh, that we would have pharmaceutical-grade cannabis that's hemp derived that could be given in all 50 states coming in the form of an ointment, which is very safe. I mean, the worst thing that can happen with an ointment uh, from a side effect is a rash on the skin. And, and it's something that I, I foresee doctors feeling very comfortable to give a hemp derived CBD ointment for osteoarthritis of the knees. And if that can help uh, reduce the dosage of opiates, then that would be amazing. That would be really uh, beneficial to the patient where we can start cutting down on the short-acting opiates. And in the future, I think that client can definitely get involved um, when people are more comfortable with cannabis and the regulatory environment is better with a uh, pill 
uh, where there is uh, cannabis uh, half and, and opiates half, where these two drugs can work synergistically together, where you reduce the dosage of opiates, because opiates do have a very important role in their control of pain. I mean, it's, it's, it's here to stay. It's nothing that's going to go away, but it doesn't have to be used in the high dosages and, and the levels that it is right now. Um, one of the things that people don't know very much is that the structure of, of opiates is 98% the structure of heroin. And so this is why uh, we have such a heroin epidemic in this country, because when they made pain the fifth vital sign back in the 80s, um, they basically created an environment where opiates would be used. And when opiates are going to be used, they created an environment where these patients who are addicted now being discharged by doctors are going to go on to the cheaper form of the opiate that they can't get uh, on the street, which is heroin. And this is how heroin abuse has become so prevalent in this country, and we have this opioid epidemic. Yeah. And it an, really started back in 1980 when they made the fifth vital sign. Right. Yeah, that, I was always curious about why they became so prevalent, but, you know, it totally makes sense when you say that. And I've spoken with a number of people who are actually in practice now treating addicts, and they're finding that by introducing cannabis it actually lessens their cravings and, and allows them a more easy transition to come off of the opiates as opposed to some of the terrible withdrawals that people can have. I mean, have you, have you witnessed that as well? You know, I have not been in the other side of things, which is the uh, rehab side, but I have heard reports um, and even studies coming along showing that cannabis lessens the side effects that you'd have from uh, the withdrawal of, uh, of opiates. And I think that it makes common sense that when you take something away from a patient that they are addicted to, to not have anything can cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. And having something like cannabis, which is um, a sedative in many ways, that can relax somebody in many ways, it's a anti-anxiolytic um, in, in, in a form, it can really help uh, people get off the opiates. Yeah. But I think what, what we really need is, is, a, is a large based scientific study from an uh, institution like Harvard or Yale uh, to come along and, and show not just uh, the scientific community, but also doctors, physicians in this country, that this is a valid claim. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I, I hear that a lot from doctors who have been on the fence about whether or not they think cannabis is you know, worth uh, taking off of Schedule 1. You know, the, there's a lot of fear about it because there's not the body of science that's acceptable within the United States. From the DEA perspective or from the congressional perspective, they're always looking for U.S. studies. But a lot of people fail to realize that there are 25,000 or more studies available on the U.S. Uh, governmental database of, of clinical studies that deal with cannabis and its safety and efficacy and all of that. But I wonder how you feel about, you know, the pharmaceutical companies as a whole not embracing this and feeling threatened by the regulation of cannabis as if that would diminish their profits. I mean, you know, clearly you see a time and place and need for opiates, for example, and the need for opiates won't go away with cannabis. But what would you what would you say to the pharmaceutical industry if you could have them? you know, all of the major players in a room together? Well, I, I would say that it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when um, cannabis will be a Schedule II drug. And soon as it is, you'll see the, every single CEO of every pharmaceutical company that has not embraced it, embrace it because it will make them money. Um, it, it's it, Pharmaceutical companies is a, is, is a capitalistic-based uh, system, uh, and, and it thrives in that. And it, as long as... Um, they have an environment where they can make money, they will jump on it. And and right now, it's easier to make money in just the opiate world than it would be with cannabis because of all the regulatory concerns and the fact that it's a Schedule 1. But I think in the future, cannabis com I, I'm sorry, uh, pharmaceutical companies will embrace cannabis as a synergistic uh, drug, and they will be buying out many other companies in the future that are already uh, making opiates along with cannabis. Yeah, and I, I it's would, just a matter of time. Right, and I, I would think that it would really enhance their standing with the general public, too, if they did embrace it. I mean, 
and especially where it comes to uh, the opiate addiction epidemic, because if cannabis can help uh, alleviate some of those problems, I would think that the pharmaceutical companies would stop getting such a bad rap about it. Yeah, I, I think it would definitely help their reputation, especially given um, the consensus uh, among the public in the U.S. where study after study has shown that people favor uh, cannabis uh, to be used as a, a medis- on a medicinal basis. It's been shown on multiple studies to be effective for nausea, for seizures, for insomnia, for pain um, in all of these uh, areas and, and, and many others uh, that still need to be studied. But these areas, it's been pretty proven to have worked. And, and so for pharmaceutical companies to not be using it, I understand right now because it is a Schedule One drug. But I, I do think that once the government and the regulatory environment makes it a Schedule Two, which means that it, it, it can be addictive, however, it's got medicinal medical benefit, then the, can, then the uh, pharmaceutical company should come on board. Yeah, I would definitely think so. And I wonder also... I read in an article that you were talking about how the opiate epidemic is actually claiming like 33,000 lives each year or has been, you know, lately. And it just, it seems that that number goes up every year. Do you really believe that putting cannabis in schedule two might help that? Or do you think that it should be descheduled to the point where it's on a par with like, um, let's say, Tylenol? I think that um, cannabis can have some mind-altering effects, for sure, that we all are familiar with, with THC being present in it. And and so any psychoactive drug needs to be on a Schedule II basis. You can't really um, make it over the counter when you're giving it for medicinal benefit. Um, So uh, by, by controlling the milligrams and by controlling the dosage and the frequency with which a patient is taking it, um, a physician can prescribe it for uh, uh, a variety of conditions, uh, whether it be chronic pain um, or whether it be nausea. Now, in the case of uh, pain, you can actually then start reducing the opiates. And by reducing the opiates, uh, that's the magic uh, pill here because now uh, the dependence will be lower, addiction will be lower, and so with the number of deaths. Because now these patients would not go on to wanting to take heroin uh, because their uh, um, cannabis opiate combination pill was stopped because they wouldn't be addicted to opiates at the level they are now because they'd be getting a much lower dosage. Yeah. That so the death rate would fall. So I, I really do see cannabis being a, a very important part of uh, fighting the opiate epidemic. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. And when you start seeing what you saw, I, I imagine you couldn't help but really believe that. And as far as um, its ability to actually treat pain on a topical level, um, are you or have you been conducting any studies at all uh, with regard to like the ointment that you were discussing? Yes, we, we have. Um, actually, we just gave uh, 200 samples to some of the doctors at National Spine and Pain Center. Um, we're actually in the midst of shipping it today. Um, and they're going to go ahead and give it to 50 patients, four doctors giving it to 50 patients, 200 samples, and, and conclude um, what the results are. And there's already been one trial done with 50 patients where we saw that, I'm sorry, with 40 patients, where we saw that 32 patients um, got significant uh, relief with the ointment, with the topical ointment, um, and eight of them said that it was okay. So, so that's a very good efficacy rate with which to uh, go ahead and do further studies. And and so we're doing what we call efficacy trials. It's not a clinical study because what I want to do is to not really um, keep testing things, but really get this into the hands of patients um, if if I know it works. And, And from having done the first 40 patients, there's a very positive sign that it works. And when these studies come out with the 200 samples, uh, um, clouds come out with the 200 samples, uh, we will know uh, which formulations are working. And if we need to, you know, kind of make something a little tweak it here or there to make it better. But the initial uh, data that we've had so far has been very, very uh, positive. Yeah. Have you been following any of the legislation that's um, been sitting in committee, like, for instance, the Carers Act and followed any of the congressional moves? 
Um, uh, some of them I hear about, but I don't follow it on a kind of a, a regular basis or anything. I, I try not to let the politics of this affect my vision and my um, um, kind of uh, will to uh-huh. see this kind of come through. Like many, many people say like, oh, you should do FDA trials and so on. Well, if I go to the FDA with it, this will never get to the market. It'll never get to the hands of patients. And so by being able to do my own clinical studies the way we are, the, the clinical trials we are right now, and because it's hemp derived, I can put it out in Amazon. I can put it out in all 50 states. There is nothing illegal about CBD, uh, which is derived from hemp. Which is So CBD is a component of cannabis, and it's called cannabidiol. And that's the active ingredient in the ointment that helps with pain. Right. Yeah, and I know a lot of people have um, experienced great relief with concentrates, uh, CBD concentrated in tinctures. You know, I I started giving it to my own father for Parkinson's, and I know a lot of people who are having great success just with spasticity of MS and even epilepsy and autism and all that. It just seems like such a miracle drug, if you want to call it a drug, (laughs) plant-based miracle that, that has helped so many people. I'm really anxious to see what happens in the long run with it, especially because we have this budget uh, issue coming up pretty soon. And if there, there was a provision in the, in the 2015 omnibus budget whereby the funds were omitted from the DEA budget to go out and prosecute people in states where cannabis has been legalized for medical use. And if that line item goes back in the budget, there might be a danger for even hemp-derived CBD, which is causing a lot of people some anxiety in anticipation of that. But, you know, for right now, it's it's incredible that people can get this online. And is Climb Holdings um, putting out more products, too? I noticed that this is like seed funding toward the cannabis sector, but what are some of the upcoming product lines or what is it that you're, you're looking to invest in? Sure. Uh, let, me, let me go back a little bit and give you some reassurance. Um, the World Health Organization just recognized about a week ago um, that uh, CBD uh, was to, to not be a drug. Um, they, they considered uh, a drug in the sense of uh, uh, cannabis. The cannabidiol is not uh, considered a drug by the World Health Organization. And I think that that's going to go a long, long way in all these political maneuvering going on, especially with this current administration, of not letting um, cannabis or, or CBD be uh, used for its uh, appropriate use. So, so I, I think that when, when the World Health Organization recognizes something like this, it's going to be a positive force for CBD overall um, on a national level. Um, as far as crime is concerned, so we have uh, uh, three different products, one in the recreational space, um, one uh, that's going to be in the wellness space, and one that's going to be in the medicinal space. For the recreational space, um, it's the, their um, uh, cannabis oils, and it's in the seven legalized states. And what we um, do is to market and brand uh, the product, and, and, and we have the processors uh, fill the cartridges. And we make sure that we work with processors that are top of the line, um, and we assure uh, testing with testing that, that the uh, actual cannabis in the cartridge is of high quality and proper doses, and we also really advocate for proper use of cannabis. Um, so things like not, dri- not while driving or... or, or you know, uh, machinery use or, or something like that. So that's on the recreational side. On the on the medicinal side, we're coming out with uh, 36 different products of combining uh, CBD with um, known medications out there like lidocaine and, and non-steroidals that are known to work in a topical clean uh, for patients to use for medicinal use. And, and it does not need a prescription. It's over the counter. Um, I've said many times it's like going to buy Bengay. Um, it doesn't need a physician prescription, but we would like for physicians to use it because it gives it even more um, exposure to patients. But with or without physicians, we would go ahead and put it on the market. And and then the uh, third line of product is a wellness product, and that's really 
focused for uh, working women and, and you know, uh, uh, individuals who just need um, kind of a, a de-stressing, uh, a relaxation type of um, uh, uh, medication or, or, or uh, ointment, let's say, that they would use in the middle of the day to just uh, uh, feel uh, better overall as, as, a, as a wellness uh, item. Right. So those are the three lines that we're one of them is already on the market, which is the recreational line, and it's called MESD. Oh, say that again. It's called what? MESD, M-E-Z-Z. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, I did see that. I wasn't sure what that was when I when I was looking yeah. it up. So um, you raised a really interesting uh, point, actually, and I, I kind of see uh, cannabis going in this direction in the future as it as you know, it becomes less stigmatized, more normalized, and uh, less of a, a niche, a niche uh, substance to market. Because I think that if if you were to introduce uh, CBD into some of these common over the counter medications, like Bengay, you said, then it just becomes another ingredient in a normal mainstream uh, product. That, exactly. Yeah, and and that actually will help to normalize Perfect. it too. I think that's exactly what we're doing. So we're this is why I'm not doing FDA studies. Uh, I'm going straight to the market and and getting it into the hands of people, because by the time the FDA approves something like this, uh, another thirty three thousand people will have died. Yeah, and in a way, this is this is why it is sort of a, a blessing, not a curse, that it is still um, ridiculously scheduled as Schedule One. And the state laws are are really kind of guiding what happens. But on a national level, the CBD from hemp, as long as it has less than three tenths of a percent, I guess it is, of um, THC, the psychoactive THC. ingredient, yeah, then it can. It, it's basically, despite what you might hear from from the Department of Justice these days, it is it is a legal substance according to the Ninth Circuit, anyway. So yeah. I, I think that's a brilliant yeah. idea. Like how and many, most, uh, go ahead. Most of our products have 0% THC. So the whole THC conversation goes away. Right. Um, I'm, I'm really trying to make a situation here where nobody can argue the introduction of these products into the market from, from real health care. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that also that sets, I think, climb apart from all the other thousands of companies out there is that you have a medical doctor and investment banking at, at its highest level um, co- working together with an operator who's been in the cannabis space for f- over five years. Um, and and uh, that, that kind of partnership um, is still not there except for Climb right now. Yeah, and <laughs> five years in the cannabis industry is like 20 years in any other industry because it's just moving so quickly. Right. Mm-hmm. And it hasn't been around that long, so you're really coming out with something unique, I think. Um, the the acronym, just for people who don't know, is actually, uh, and forgive me if I say it wrong, Cannabis Lifestyle Innovation sure. Marketing and Business, is that right? And And branding. Marketing and branding. And branding. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting. And I, I like to hear that there's a collaboration of people from different sectors of business coming together to um, innovate new products and, and find ways to integrate cannabis into the, the more mainstream, acceptable, publicly acceptable products that are just on every pharmacy shelf um, over the counter. So it's it's pretty interesting, and I know that there's just so much opportunity too. And education, I think, is really key. So in the in the marketing arm of this, what is it that um, that Klein might be doing right now in terms of the educational component of this to bring these things to market? Well, um, we already have one of the top spine uh, professionals in in the country. Um, as a part of our medical advisory board, I, I look forward to um, uh, one of my one or two of my partners um, uh, from the uh, National Spine and Pain Centers also being on the medical advisory board and then uh, lecturing to other physicians around the country regarding the efficacy of cannabis that they found by doing the study themselves um, in in the treatment of chronic pain or at, at least in this case the efficacy of cannabidiol uh, component of cannabis in the treatment of pain. 
So these, these individuals not only have authority and leadership in the country as, as medical doctors, but they will also have their own experience. I think that um, that's going to be so important, and with, especially once um, more and more entities are out there giving CME credits, continuing medical education credits to doctors, so that they can feel like they at least have some uh, sort of credential behind them as they begin to embrace cannabis as an alternative. It really is just an important aspect of moving this, this uh, movement forward. The key event that you'll see happen is uh, uh, cannabis being listed as a Schedule II. But before that, cannabidiol, has, uh, which is a key component of cannabis, um, has already been classified as something that can be used for the treatment of pain. And, and so um, we're moving forward with that cannabidiol component and getting it out there in, in all 50 states. <laughs> Despite the fact that it did happen to get its own numerical code last January within the Schedule One, which uh, a lot of people were scratching their heads, thinking, "Why? Why would they actually do that?" Because the um, the Ninth Circuit ruling uh, actually supersedes anything that the DEA could say about it, so it's going to remain legal unless another higher court decides to reverse that ruling. But I, I'm always really curious when, when I hear things like that because it just seemed like it was such a ridiculous waste of time to, uh, to give CBD its own, its own numerical code. And uh, I don't know. What were your feelings about that? Did you, did you follow that at all? Well, what I, what I think is when you get into the politics of this, it's, it's all a manipulation uh, process. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, depending on the administration that's present, uh, all lobbyists and people have different motivations. And, and what I try and do is to stay uh, a, a purist in terms of the science and helping people, uh, uh, whether the science helps people. And so um, that does not, politics does not follow that in so many different ways that I, I can't even tell you. So I, I, I really just try and stick with the science and, and helping people directly. Yeah, well, the very good, uh, very good policy there, I would think. Yeah, because um, it, it's very, it's difficult, I think, for people to separate that, though, especially if, for example, in Alaska, when some people were recently um, arrested for having uh, cannabidiol on their shelves for some very strange reason. And, you know, despite the fact that they probably would have preferred to uh, not have any kind of law enforcement or political interference with their business, you know, the fact remains that it, it is a challenge for some people who really are just trying to bring the product to the general public in, you know, especially a product that cannot possibly kill someone. It just is very, very tough, I think, for that to remain completely out of the equation. But, you know, it is so important, I think, for people to remain focused on the science of it. And so I can totally appreciate your feelings about that, uh, most definitely. So what is next, then, for you? Well, uh, it's really to get uh, the uh, topical uh, ointments on the shelves, uh, first quarter of 2018, and um, get it uh, to a point where patients are being able to take it and uh, find relief and and hopefully reduce their opiates. Um, and if that can be done, that we'll have a we'll have uh, succeeded in doing what we wanted to for 2018. Yeah, it, it's quite ambitious what you're doing, and um, you know, kudos to you for doing it. And you also had an investment group that you were part of, and was that also um, related to to what you're doing in the cannabis space now? Yes. Um, so, so the investment company that I have is the actual partner in Klein that's I working. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've also chosen to do some other ventures with it, like sightseeing in Los Angeles and, and real estate in, 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 um, in Macau. Uh, for for the middle income people, but everything I do with this investment company really has to do with um, helping people in one way, shape, or form. Whether it's to provide uh, reasonable housing or whether it's to let families uh, appreciate the the sights and scenery of uh, Los Angeles in a safe manner, um, or whether it's to get CBD out onto the market, 
the purpose of the investment group is to um, help uh, people in one way, shape, or form. Yeah, we have a we have a mission. Um, the parent company that uh, my partner and I started a while back, which um, gave birth to the Cannabis Reporter, and it's uh, to create a better world, one word at a time. And you know, I think that it's it's refreshing to hear of businesses that are actually taking that approach because I think there are profits to be made when when you really are trying to also help people in in life in general. So it's a, a noble ambition, I think. <laughs> Congratulations for that. Yeah, I think that's the best way to make a profit is to know that you've actually done something that has helped somebody else. And, yeah. and for that, you know, people wish you well, and and you're not um, you're not taking from anybody. You're you're actually giving more than you're taking, which is uh, a nice thing to do. Yeah, and I think that also if, if we help people thrive, everyone does better. Right. It's you know it's it's what goes around comes around too, but I think that you know you really create an, an environment where people have have the ability to thrive. And it's it's exciting for me to hear that actually from you. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what happens when your products come out. And right now, it's a vaping product, right? That's coming out in the seven states where where adult use is legal, and and then the the CBD ointments and that sort of thing. Will there be a standalone product, or are these just the molecules going into other over the counter products? That will be marketed in that way. Oh no, they're, they're standalone. Okay. So the CBD uh, the CBD ointments are standalone products, and they're being uh, uh, made based on the ingredients that I'm I'm telling them to put into it. Um, so we have chemists uh, associated with pharma- uh, pharmacy companies that are able to make the product uh, for us, and then we're getting them to market. And the recreational product has been around for almost like two years, and um, we're looking to shore up some really good contracts with some processors and make sure that the product uh, quality is at the highest level in um, Colorado, uh, Washington, California, and Nevada. Yeah. Well, good. I, I think that that'll be an exciting thing to look forward to. And are you going to be participating in any of the events that are coming up? Um, sometimes I do it. It depends on what my schedule shows. Right now, I don't have anything, but uh, um, I'll be there at the right events to, uh, to you know, when, when when we need it. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is great. So, um, anything else you'd like to to add before we wrap it up? If if you want any information on on Climb Holdings, just go to www.climbholdings.com. And there is um, some more information on our products and, and what we have coming out. Great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll have some information on our website, too, when I put the episode up. So people will be able to uh, look it up and, and follow your progress there. Well, I'm very happy that you were able to take some time today to share your insights. I'm looking forward to following your progress, and I'm wishing you uh, a lot of luck with it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you for a great conversation. (laughs) You're certainly welcome. All right. So uh, once again, it's time for us to bring yet another show to a close. It always goes by too quickly when we're enjoying the conversation. But thank you so much to my guest, Dr. Bobby Day, for sharing his insights and knowledge with us today. If you would like to learn more about the work that he's doing, please visit us online at thecannabisreporter.com. Click podcast to find today's episode and there you will find links to his website along with his bio and more information we have a lot of other people to thank first i would like to express our gratitude for our radio sponsors hemp meds Helterra, and compassionate certification centers we certainly couldn't be doing this without you i'd also like to thank dr brian donner for our medical marijuana minute Eric Goodall, the composer of our theme song, Evergreen. And of course, it goes without saying how much we appreciate our producer, Ed, and engineer, John, and the team here at Star Worldwide Networks for making us shine. Oh, and last but not least, thanks to all of you for listening. I'm Snowden Bishop, inviting you to join me again next week, same time, same place, for another episode of the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. Until we meet again, be safe, stay informed, 
share what you've learned and make it a great day. Evergreens come.